Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my September wrap up. Today I want to tell you about all the books that I've read in the month of September. So I read 14 books in September, three of them were unpublished novels that I read for work, I work for a publisher, but the other 11 are books that I can talk to you about, so I will get straight into the books and I will start off as usual with the classics, because I've read quite a few classics this month. This month I finally finished reading The Count of Monte Cristo, which I started back in August. I have been listening to this on audiobook, it is a 50 hour audiobook, so it's taken me quite a while, but it was definitely very very worth it. So The Count of Monte Cristo is a 19th century French classic and it is a bit of a revenge tale. It tells a story of a young man called Edmond Dante who um, is betrayed by some people that he knows um, and is kind of sold into the authorities as a Bonapartist spy, even though he is not a Bonapartist spy. He gets sent to prison and while there he proclaims that if he ever gets out of prison he will wreak revenge on the people who did this to him and put him in prison and everything goes on from there. It is really really fantastic. It's a very long book but it's one of those books that really earns its length and I didn't feel like anything was wasted. It's such a fantastic novel, um, so engaging, so clever, so interesting, so like emotionally compelling um, and just really really great. I really really loved it. I think it's a truly wonderful story. I can see why so many people love it and I really really got invested in it and just yeah a really fascinating story and um, the history behind it is really really interesting the kind of intricacies of like French polite society and um, the clever revenge plots in it um, and the kind of character development is really wonderful as well. I feel like it reminded me quite a lot of Wuthering Heights um, but I feel like it wouldn't necessarily remind everyone of Wuthering Heights and that's just me but I feel like I'm drawing lots of interesting parallels between them in my mind in terms of the way they look at like revenge and um, a quest for revenge um, and like who has the right to um, extract revenge on people and whether or not like you could avenge yourself on people or people's like children and, and you know whether you know the sins of the parents should be um carried down to the children and things like that so yeah it was really really interesting and i very very much enjoyed it I read another 19th century French classic this month which was The Journey to the Centre of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is one that I listened to on audiobook with my partner Nick and I think both of us quite liked it but were a bit disappointed by it. We listened to Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days um, like a year or two ago and both really really loved it um, and I was kind of expecting therefore to like Journey to the Centre of the Earth more. It's not that I didn't enjoy it, it's just that it was so much less good than Around the World in 80 Days. So Journey to the Centre of the Earth, as you might be able to guess by the title, it tells a story of some people who are journeying to the centre of the earth. It tells a story of this young boy called Axel. He's sort of in his late teens um, and his uncle is a geologist who finds this like paper that is going to tell him how to get to the centre of the earth and um, Axel and his uncle um, and a guide they find in Iceland um, go down um, through lots of caves and try and find the way to the centre of the earth. I really really liked the first half and I just felt like the second half was a little bit disappointing um, and that there could have been like much more to it than there was and the end felt a little bit like a letdown. I also found Around the World in 80 Days incredibly funny and I just didn't find um, Journey to the Centre of the Earth quite so funny. Like there were some funny bits especially at the beginning but it didn't quite have the same like wonderful tone and great sense of humour as Around the World in 80 Days. So. I quite liked it, but it just wasn't as good as the other book I've read by Jules Verne. But I would still like to read more by him in the future. I read two other classics by authors who I previously read and loved that I didn't like quite as much as their other books this month. Um, one was The Longest Journey by Ian e. Forster. This is my final Ian e. Forster book, so I've now read all of Ian e. Forster's novels, which is very exciting. I'm sure there'll be an Ian e. Forster author week at some point on this channel, um, but probably in a month or two um, um, when Victoria's done and life has settled down. This is my last Ian e. Forster book and it is definitely my least favourite which is a bit sad. It's a bit of a sad way to end my Enforcer journey. It's not that I didn't like The Longest Journey, it's just that it is less good than the other Enforcer books that I've read. So The Longest Journey tells a story of a young man called Ricky from his university days and afterwards, kind of following him when he's in his 20s. We look at his relationship with um, his friends at university, with a woman who he falls in love with and also with a man who um, his aunt has sort of adopted or um, kind of 
taken on as a protege um, and we followed their relationship for quite a lot of the book as well. I think there were a lot of things in The Longest Journey that I really really enjoyed. I thought the characterization was fascinating. As always I absolutely loved Ian Forster's writing style but it was just a little bit of a mess which is not something I ever thought I'd say about Ian Forster. Like I always find Ian Forster's prop plots a little bit unpredictable but I always feel like they're unpredictable in a wonderful well thought out way whereas it just felt like with The Longest Journey that it was a little bit of a mess. There were a few times where I had to like go back and read something again because there were a few paragraphs that just didn't really make that much sense. I buddy read this with Carolyn from Carolyn's Reading Ramblings and she found the same, like there were just some bits that just weren't that clear. Um, so though I did enjoy it, I just feel like it was a bit of a disappointment of an Ian Forster novel for me, which makes me a bit sad, but there we go. I also don't know, I was reading this in like the week up to moving um, and I was like trying to race through it and finish it in time so that I could put it in storage um, because I didn't want to take a book that I was nearly finished um, when I was putting lots of my stuff into storage so maybe that was also partly why I didn't enjoy it so much, I don't know, but anyway. I also read Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, which I buddy read with Marissa from Blakeney Bookish. This is the third Daphne du Maurier book I've read and it is my least favourite so far. I did enjoy it, but I just didn't like it as much as Rebecca or my cousin Rachel, but there we go. I feel like this is a trend on these three books. So Jamaica Inn tells the story of a young woman called Mary Yellen who, um, after the death of her mother, moves in with her aunt who lives with her husband in this place called Jamaica Inn, which is this inn in the middle of nowhere where no one likes to go, where something clearly mysterious is going on and Mary starts to suspect that there is smuggling and maybe worse going on in this inn. She also meets her aunt's husband's brother, Jem, who she becomes quite attracted to and we kind of follow everything that goes on from there. There were some things that I really liked about Jamaica Inn. It's incredibly atmospheric. I absolutely love Daphne du Maurier's writing style. I know for certain that I want to read everything by her at some point. Um, she writes wonderfully. Her books are really intriguing, really suspenseful. I really liked Mary as a character. I thought she was a really, really interesting character. Um, but there were two things I didn't like. Um, one of which was that there was one element of the plot that was a bit problematic and just uh, slightly bothered me. And it is quite an old book. It's from the 30s. So, you know, I'm not that surprised. Um, and I do think it's important to read things in the context but um, this particular element just really bothered me and it annoyed me. I don't really know how to explain that better without spoilers. There was just one particular element of the book that I found it problematic and bothered me and then also the very ending really bothered me and I don't know whether it was supposed to bother me which sort of bothers me more and I feel like because I really liked the main character Mary I cared more when I disagreed with her narrative whereas like in Rebecca I don't think I liked the main character as much so I didn't mind if I felt like she was making the wrong decisions whereas in Jamaica Inn I minded more. I still really enjoyed it but definitely not my favourite Daphne du Maurier of the three I've read so far. Again this was one that I read near the beginning of the month and I kind of read in a slight hurry um, because I wanted to put it in storage um, so I do wonder if that partly impacted my reading but there we go. Anyway, this month I also read June by Frank Herbert, which is a science fiction classic from the 1960s. I've been meaning to read this for a very long time and I'm glad that I finally got round to it. I rather enjoyed this. It was a really intriguing novel. It is set in this desert planet um, where like water is money because it's so rare, like water is the main currency. Um, and we follow this family, the Duke, his um, concubine and their son um, who move to this desert planet. Um, and then the son of the Duke, Paul, has has some certain potential mysterious magical abilities um, and we follow his journey on the planet and like the goalposts change a lot so it's quite hard for me to explain the plot um, but I found it really enjoyable in many ways. The world building was fascinating like I think my favourite thing about June was the world building. The world, this desert planet is absolutely fascinating and um, the society and culture there and like the way water is so valuable that it's sort of like money was just really really fascinating. I really really liked that element. Um, I also enjoyed some of the like lore of the different like magical um, societies that exist within this science fiction world um, which um, Paul's mother Jessica is kind of part of. I found that really interesting. Um, so there were many things that I really enjoyed about it. I would say the two things that I slightly struggle with about it is one that it is a little bit confusing and there were times where I found all the politics quite hard to follow because it is quite action-packed but it's also very 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 political. Um, and then the other thing was that um, 
this is from the 60s and there were a few like gender things that just got on my nerves and it's from the 60s it was quite a while ago I you know kind of get that um, but I feel like I'm much more tolerant of problematic things in 19th century literature and somehow there's just like a switch when it's 20th century literature even though it still can be quite old where I just don't have quite so much patience so there were many things that I really enjoyed about it but just a couple of things that meant it wasn't a like brilliant read for me however I am really excited for the film which is due to come out soon. I think because one of my favourite things about this book is the world building and also because in general I think more of my watching is sci-fi than my reading is sci-fi, I can actually see myself enjoying the film of this more than the book, which is not always the case. Um, so I'm quite excited to watch that when that comes out because yeah, really like the world building and very curious to see how they do it. I can imagine it being very cinematic and impressive. Moving on to the 80s, this month I also read The Colour Purple by Alice Walker. I listened to this on audiobook and this was another buddy read with Marissa from Blatantly Bookish. This was truly, truly wonderful. This was such an amazing book. This was my favourite book of the month, I think. But there is another one that was also very excellent. The Colour Purple is a truly fantastic novel from the 1980s. It is an epistolary narrative and we follow a character called Celie and her life basically from her mid-teens into her sort of 20s, 30s and 40s um, and we follow her kind of finding a place for herself in the world, finding a family for herself um, and working out what she wants from life. The novel is set um, mostly in sort of the 20s, 30s and 40s I think and a lot of it examines what life is like for Celie as a black woman living in America in that time. There are so many things I loved about this book I don't know, quite know where to start. I really really loved the writing um, and I do think the fact I listened to an audiobook which is narrated by Alice Walker the author herself um, really made a difference to that and really brought it to life in a wonderful way but I think the main thing I really loved was the characterization and the character development which over the course of the novel is amazing like it's not a very long novel but it really packs in like so much amazing character progression and character development in a really fantastic way. I also love how it is very much a novel about like finding a place for yourself in the world and like learning to demand happiness for yourself when you feel that you don't necessarily deserve happiness which is actually something that I really love in a lot of my favourite Victorian classics like Jane Eyre and Olive um, which I really enjoyed in The Colour Purple too. There's also a lot about kind of family bonds, building your own family, finding a family for yourself. There's a lot about love, there's a lot about sexuality and it's just beautifully amazingly feminist in all the best ways um, in a way that I absolutely love. But actually I think one of the things I love most about this book is that I found it really like hopeful and empowering which I wasn't expecting. I feel like one of the only things that I knew about The Colour Purple going into it was that the central character um, is sexually abused by her father. Um, like that is something that happens at the very beginning of the book and is talked about and that was one of the only things I knew and therefore because that was one of the only things I knew I was expecting this book to be very heart-hitting, very dark, very miserable um, and it is not. And don't get me wrong, like The Colour Purple looks at some really horrific things especially at the beginning and it does deal with really dark issues, it deals with a lot of very serious issues of sexism and racism in the United States in the early 20th century um, but also it is a book about someone finding a place for themselves in the world and like building their own family and it's really hopeful and lovely as well. I feel like very emotional now. It was just amazing. So yeah, I really need to go read everything that Alice Walker has ever written now. This month I also read Havisham by Ronald Frame. This is a historical fiction novel. It is a retelling of Great Expectations from the point of view of Miss Havisham but following her like before Great Expectations um, in her childhood and like her adolescence, um, her young adulthood um, and then leading into what happens during the course of Great Expectations. I have really mixed feelings about this because I really loved the writing. It was a really engaging read. It was a very quick read actually and the writing is sort of quite sparse and stream of consciousness but always quite clear in a way that I really enjoyed. However, I just don't really see what this added to Great Expectations. I feel like a retelling of a literary classic has to have a different take on it in some way or has to like address a really minor character and make you view them differently and I just feel like this book didn't and maybe that is because I have already quite a sympathetic like um, interpretation of Miss Havisham in my mind um, partly because I love Great Expectations and I've read it lots of times and also because I think Miss Havisham is a really interesting character so maybe it's just that Ronald Frame's like reinterpretation of Miss Havisham coincides quite nicely with my interpretation of Miss Havisham but I just felt like this didn't add anything new like I already feel quite sorry for Miss Havisham and you already know quite a lot about her past in Great Expectations because you're told about it even though you don't see it in detail you do know quite a bit 
Um, so that I slightly struggled with. Basically, I quite enjoyed the writing, but I'm just not sure that this brought anything new to Great Expectations, and I feel like a retelling has to do that. Another science fiction novel I read this month was A Closed and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers, which I absolutely loved. Really, really enjoyed this. I think I might like this better than A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, which is the first book in this series. This is sort of loosely connected to it. They're set in the same world. There's a couple of crossover characters, but they're fairly separate stories. And this tells a story of two kind of misfits, effectively. One woman who is an AI who is in a kind of man-made body um, and one woman who is a clone so her body is also sort of man-made to a certain extent though she is sort of organically human in a way the AI is not um, and it basically looks at their friendship um, and their lives um, and it was just really really touching and amazing and it is a book about what it means to be not human exactly because a lot of the characters in this book aren't human but a book about what it means to be a person um, in a really lovely heartwarming way and I found it really really engaging. I also really love that Becky Chambers writes very very um, character-led science fiction. I really enjoyed A Close the Common Orbit, it was really good fun, it was really touching and moving, like bits of it made me cry like quite a lot um, and it was just a really lovely story about friendship and finding a place for yourself in the world again um, and you know learning to believe that you are a person and understand your importance as a person so yeah just really really enjoyed it really really great read definitely recommend this one. Another very good book I read this month was The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. Emily St. John Mandel is one of my absolute favourite authors. Um, she's just wonderful. I've now read all five of her novels, all of which I've absolutely loved, um, but The Glass Hotel was just absolutely amazing. This book tells the story of a brother and sister, Paul and Vincent, and their kind of complicated lives and complicated relationships. Um, we follow Paul and Vincent and various other characters around them at different parts in their lives. Um, and we're basically following Paul and Vincent's relationship, but also how Vincent gets caught up in this um, kind of complicated messy economic situation by being married to someone who may or may not be running a bit of a scam um, financial system. It's really hard to explain why an Emily St John Mandel novel um, is brilliant by its premise because I feel like what is amazing about her books is not the premise but the execution and don't get me wrong the premise is fascinating um, and the way she talks about like money and economics and this like messy financial system that's all gone wrong is brilliant but what I really love about this book is that we follow lots of different characters at different points in their lives um, flipping backwards and forwards in time until we slowly build up a picture of Vincent and Paul and other characters around them um, until we slowly build up a picture of what's going on. I love the writing, I love the structure, I love how Mandel just like weaves these different plots together in just like the most clever wonderful ways and I love the clarity of her writing like I love that the structure of her novels shouldn't work because it should be confusing but it's just never confusing because she writes so brilliantly and with such precision and clarity that it's just perfect like her writing is just like the perfect writing for me I think I absolutely love it it's so good and this was fantastic I'm trying to work out where this like ranks in my Emily St John Mandel love I feel like Lola Quartet is still at the top but then Stage 11 then The Glass Hotel then Last Night in Montreal then The Singer's Gun I think but I don't know because I love them all I need to reread all of them really I've only read them once um, and I just think she's such a wonderful writer this is fantastic highly highly recommend it so good I feel like Station Eleven is very well known and a lot of people haven't read any of the rest of her books but you really have to because she's such a brilliant writer and all of her books are amazing finally I also read two rom-coms in September and um, both of these are for a book club that I'm doing with some friends focusing on commercial women's fiction one of them is the September pick and one of them is the October pick because I don't want to read any rom-coms in October when I'm going to be doing all Victorian literature so one of them was The Love Square by Laura Jane Williams Williams. This is a rom-com about a woman, she's 30 years old, she's living in London um, and she works at a cafe um, and she hasn't met a man that she likes for quite a while but then she meets one man and then a bit later, quite a bit later, she meets two other men um, and then she gets herself trapped in a bit of a love square. At least that's the premise and that's like what's on the copy um, but actually she doesn't meet the second and third love interests till like halfway through the book um, so it is a bit more of a straightforward rom-com than 
it says on the tin, as it were. Um, there were some things that I really liked about this. The main character runs a cafe and is a chef, which I really enjoyed. Um, and also, five years before, um, the main character had cancer, which um, meant that she went through early menopause, um, and so she can't have children naturally, or she can't carry children, but she does have some frozen eggs um, from that time. Um, and I feel like that element of the book and her kind of wanting to have children um, and kind of working out the best way for her to do that and what it would be like if she has children as a single parent I thought was really really fantastic and really interestingly dealt with but I didn't like the romance plot line quite so much. I feel like the main th issue I had was that if a book is called The Love Square and there's a love square or a love triangle or anything like that I feel like there has to be some suspense about who they're going to end up with and I just didn't feel like there was any. Like I felt it was very clear from the beginning, from page one, who the main love interest was and the other two were just like there for drama um, and I felt that wasn't really what I wanted it to be I suppose. I wanted a bit more tension about who was going to be the main love interest. And then the other slight issue I did have is that I felt that quite a lot of the dialogue was a little bit unrealistic um, and just not really how people talk but I'm not sure. It wasn't a big deal and um, it was more the love interest thing that slightly bothered me. So it was a really enjoyable read but not my favourite rom-com. Like I don't mind a predictable rom-com. Some of the joy of a rom-com sometimes is that it is predictable but I think if the premise is a love triangle or a love square there has to be a bit less predictability about who they're going to end up with. But there we go. Then I also read The Hating Game by Sally Thorne which is a US rom-com um, which I really really enjoyed actually. This was great fun and this is quite predictable but it's supposed to be and I wasn't expecting it to not be so that's fine. It has the sort of hate to love trope so it follows these two characters. Um, our main character works in a publishers um, and there has been a merger between two different publishers and she is the assistant to the CEO of one of the companies and then sitting across from her in her office is um, the assistant to the CEO of the other company that they merged with um, who's a guy and they hate each other um, and they like just try and mess with each other all the time um, but of course they don't actually hate each other and there's more complicated feelings going on there and everything goes on from there. I really enjoyed this, it's very good fun and the characterization was really really interesting um, and the kind of character relationships and the developing character relationships I felt were really interesting and quite believable too. I also feel like it's one of those commercial women's fiction books that has an awful lot to say about mental health in a really interesting way which I really liked, like it's a lot about loneliness and feeling that you're on your own and feeling that you haven't learned like achieved as much as you could have done in life. Um, the main character she often feels very very isolated like she doesn't have very many friends um, and I think the way that is explored and that kind of struggle in her life is really really fantastic and I really really enjoyed it as well as it being a very satisfying read. Um, the one little thing that I would say is that I really really enjoyed the like work element in it and I feel like all the details of the publishing industry in the US um, and like their kind of rivalry for a promotion that comes up was really really interesting and that in like the last quarter of the book it kind of moved away from the work stuff a bit which I felt, felt was a shame like I would have liked more of the work stuff later on but apart from that I thought it was a really good read and really really great fun um, and yeah just just what I want in a rom-com really. So there we go those are the 11 books that I read in September obviously I failed to get to quite a lot of books that were on my TBR at the beginning of the month but that is always how it goes um, and I forgot about the books for my book club <laughs> when I did my TBR at the beginning of the month so there we go. I am really sad that I completely failed to read Germinal by Emil Zola because I was supposed to be doing a read-along of that which was hosted by Pauline from Dancing Lawn. I just completely failed but I do still really want to read that book so hopefully I will read it um, at some point in the next few months but we will see. So that is all for now thank you very much for watching do let me know down in the comments if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them and that's it I'll be back very soon with another bookish video. Mm -hmm.